Mayday, Mayday. This is Speedbird 9. We have lost all four engines. Repeat, we have lost all four engines. Roger, Speedbird 9. The data. Understand you have lost number four engine. Recorded, Speedbird 9. Mayday, Mayday. We have lost all four engines. There is a possibility we may have to ditch. Four engines, of course, don't fail. It's something that we're told will never happen. So the first thing that you think is that uh, you've made a mistake. It, they can't have failed, so you don't believe it. Over the past several years, there have been a number of aircraft encounters with volcanic ash plumes, which have almost become flight disasters. We in the aviation industry are just beginning to understand how dangerous volcanic ash plumes can be for commercial aircraft. In this program, we will explain how volcanoes are affecting commercial aviation, take you through an ash encounter, and show you what it does to an airplane. We will see how one airline managed its operations safely, even in the shadow of an active volcano. And we will review the recommended procedures for escaping an ash plume. Volcanoes have always been a nuisance to aviation, but they came to wide public attention in 1980. Several jet aircraft suffered damage while flying through volcanic ash from Mount St. Helens in the northwestern United States. Two years later, in 1982, there were a number of serious encounters with ash plumes. Among these incidents were a British Airways 747 that flamed out all four engines during a nighttime encounter with the ash plume from an Indonesian volcano. We'll hear from the captain of that flight in a few moments. Two other 747s experienced engine problems during similar ash encounters in Indonesia, one in 1982 and another in 1985. In 1989, a 747 experienced a four-engine flameout during an encounter with ash from Mount Redoubt in Alaska. Other eruptions in Indonesia, Japan, Italy, and the United States also led to damaging encounters. And the problem seems to be getting worse. During the eruptions of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991, there were 15 separate ash encounters within six months. Clearly, we need to be better informed about volcanoes and the hazards of volcanic ash. Volcanoes are the locations where molten rock or magma from the Earth's interior erupts at the surface. Such lava flows provide one of nature's most awesome spectacles. But when the magma explodes through the crust and is ejected into the air, it is a very real threat to aviation. The exploding magma forms huge billowing plumes of pulverized rock. Each year, about 60 of the world's volcanoes produce eruptions. Of these 60, about 10 will produce ash plumes that will reach the cruise altitudes of commercial traffic. That's about one potentially dangerous ash plume each month, somewhere around the globe. And about once each year, one of those 60 active volcanoes will have a major eruption, violent enough to send shattered rock into the stratosphere where high altitude jet streams can spread the ash all the way around the globe. To help us understand the relationship between volcanoes and aviation, let's consider where volcanoes occur. As we plot the location of active volcanoes, we will see that they occur mostly in long linear belts. And a great many of these active volcano belts are located around the rim of the Pacific Ocean. This hotbed of volcanism is known as the Pacific Ring of Fire. It includes active volcanoes of Micronesia and the Philippines, and more than 100 active volcanoes in Indonesia. There are many volcanoes in Japan, along the Kamchatka Peninsula, and among the Aleutian Islands of Alaska. There are also active volcanoes in the Cascade Mountains of the western United States. 
and a great many volcanoes in Central America and all the way south through the Andes Mountains in South America. Other volcanic belts are located in Italy, home of the famous Mount Vesuvius and Mount Etna, in East Central Africa, and in the Caribbean Islands, where there was an eruption of Mount Pele in 1902. But the volcanoes of the Pacific Ring of Fire are of greatest concern to commercial aviation, because many of the standard air routes pass right over these active volcanic regions, and many more are within reach of ash plumes generated by these volcanoes. To understand why volcanic eruptions are so hazardous to commercial jet aircraft, let's review some characteristics of volcanoes. Volcanoes vary widely in type and size, and the same volcano may have different types of eruptions at different times. About three-fourths of the world's active volcanoes have explosive eruptions that might affect aviation. The majority of explosive volcanoes have relatively small eruptions that produce only modest ash plumes, such as this one from Sakurajima volcano in Japan. Such eruptions may occur frequently, but only last for a few minutes and the plumes seldom rise more than 25,000 feet above the volcano. The resulting ash is only a concern to aviation if there are airports nearby. The significant danger to aviation comes when a volcano has a major eruption, one that blasts shattered rock into the stratosphere and lasts for hours. For example, Mount St. Helens exploded violently in 1980, blasting more than 500 million tons of pulverized rock into the air. That eruption continued for more than nine hours. During such explosive eruptions, the superheated ash column can rise vertically at rates exceeding 3,000 feet per minute. Within the first 30 minutes, the St. Helens ash column rose to 90,000 feet and spread out into a mushroom-shaped plume almost 50 miles across. The St. Helens plume spread downwind more than 600 miles within 15 hours and within two weeks had spread all the way around the world. Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines erupted in 1991. The Pinatubo eruption was 10 times larger than St. Helens. The ash column rose to an altitude of 100,000 feet and the plume spread downwind across the ocean and past Singapore within 12 hours. Giant plumes such as these can affect air traffic thousands of miles away from the volcano. To understand why volcanic ash is such a hazard to aviation, let's take a closer look at it. Volcanic ash is just tiny pieces of rock, ranging in size from sand to an extremely fine powder. The very fine ash looks and feels a lot like soft talcum powder but it's composed mostly of silicate minerals and glass. If we take a closer look at some typical ash through the microscope, we can see the rock particles and shards of glass. Note that many of the particles have very sharp edges. We've also found that some of these particles are quite hard, about as hard as tool steel, so the ash is extremely abrasive. And here's another surprise. If we heat the ash up to about 600 degrees Celsius, it melts. This glass paperweight was made entirely from melted St. Helens ash. The important message for pilots is this. Don't think of an ash plume as just another weather cloud. If you fly through ash, the airplane will be damaged. The ash very quickly pits all leading edges, including the landing light lenses and windshields. Here's a windshield out of a 747 that flew through an ash plume for less than five minutes. The left side of this windshield is pitted so badly that you can't identify anything through it. Losing forward vision is a problem, but a more serious problem is losing thrust. Volcanic ash damages jet engines, and the damage can occur very quickly. 
the abrasive ash erodes the compressor blades, which degrades performance even if the engine doesn't flame out. The higher the thrust setting, the more rapid the erosion. The fine ash quickly fills the cavities in the engines, compacting into hard deposits that choke airflow. The buildup of ash in critical areas restricts airflow and causes an increase of back pressure in the engine. The ash also plugs guide vane cooling holes and causes coking and partial plugging of the fuel nozzles. The plugged air vanes restrict atomization of the fuel. If combustor temperature is hot enough, the ash melts and accumulates as glassy deposits. It is important to understand that engine combustor temperatures at thrust settings above idle can be hot enough to melt the ingested ash. Here are typical combustor exit temperatures for a high bypass jet engine. If we superimpose the melting temperatures of volcanic ash, it is apparent why ash melts at higher thrust settings. Actually, the melting temperature of ash depends upon particle size. Particles smaller than about 50 microns will melt even at flight idle. About 75% of particle mass in an ash bloom is larger than 50 microns and therefore below melting temperature at flight idle. The combined effects of blade erosion and restricted airflow cause engine surge and very quickly engine flame out and the ash clogged fuel nozzles will make the engine very difficult to start. In addition to engine damage, the fine ash clogs oil filters, plugs the pitots, enters the bleed air system, and contaminates the fuel tanks. To better appreciate what happens when a jet liner enters an ash plume, let's consider an actual incident. On June the 24th, 1982, uh, I was captain on the BA-9 from Kuala Lumpur to, in Malaysia to Perth in Western Australia, Boeing 747-200 Rolls-Royce engines. Well, it was an absolutely normal flight up and well, we'd had our dinner and we got out across the Indian Ocean. Uh, I looked on the radar, nothing ahead, and I left my seat to go back to the, uh, to the toilet. And uh, I hadn't been down the stairs hardly uh, when I was summoned back up on the flight deck. And as I ran up the stairs, I saw smoke, or what appeared to be smoke, coming in around the floor inlets. And I rushed up on the flight deck, and the other two, my flight engineer and my co-pilot, were in fact watching a beautiful display of St. Elmo's fire. But this St. Elmo's fire began to develop and develop. And then the first officer looked back, and he said to me, you look back in your engines and tell me if there's a bright light in there. And I looked back, and sure enough, it was like a magnesium flare burning behind the fan. And then our attention was drawn back inside because the flight engineer said number four engine had failed. So I looked back in. And sure enough, it had failed. So I ordered that to be shut down, which he and the first officer did according to the, uh, the procedure, doing the memory drills, and then he pulled out the checklist. And I know from looking at the tape since that that took them 30 seconds. And as soon as uh, he'd said that, he then said, number two's gone, number three's gone, and something like, oh golly gosh, we've lost a lot. But I'll leave that to the imagination. Well, that's something, that Four engines, of course, don't fail. It's something that we're told will never happen. So the first thing that you think is that uh, you've made a mistake. It, they can't have failed, so you don't believe it. I said to the co-pilot, you send out a mayday call, and I'll do the drill with the engineer. And he then started to try and transmit on uh, the frequency that we were working with, Jakarta. And he found that he was having great trouble for two reasons. Firstly, they couldn't bring themselves to believe what he was saying, that all four engines had failed. And we were also having trouble because we seemed to be in an electronic cocoon to some extent. And it, at times it was worse than others in that there was tremendous static on the, the VHF. But we started at 37,000 feet. And I would think that the first uh, full checklist we did, we probably lost two or 3,000 feet. Uh, I'm, I have no, I can't remember at this stage how often we did it and how many times we did it. But I would think we probably did the full checklist on the way down, from the 37 down to the 12 and a half, probably 20 times or so. Well, we got one engine started at about uh, 13,000 feet. 
It took another minute and, minute and 20 seconds to get to number uh, three, I think it was, going. And then one and two came in with a gigantic roar about 20 seconds later. Um, but number two engine then started to surge and badly surge. It vibrated and it surged and it boom, boom, it went boom, 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 boom. And the aeroplane was lurching from side to side. And I did actually think it might shake itself off the wing. So I eventually shut it down. And we got over the beacon or over the airfield at 10,000 feet clear of the high ground, and we just had to let down out to sea in a teardrop pattern and come back in for a right, right base at about 2,500 feet towards Jakarta. However, when we turned into the runway and, try, and established on the localizer, I then became aware that this sort of bloom on the windscreen, in fact, as you looked into the lights, made it totally opaque. And you could see forward only poorly through about a two-inch strip down the uh, left and right-hand sides of the, uh, of the front windscreens. So I had then to uh, sort of stand up, half stand up, peer around the edge, fly this aeroplane on three engines with a bit of rudder on, uh, down the approach. And I really didn't sit back down in the seat properly and, uh, until about 100 feet over the threshold. And I remember remarking, oh, well, we're not going to die now. Oh, and the aeroplane landed itself, it just kissed the earth. In this particular incident, the crew had no warning the volcano was active. The British Airways incident occurred at night, and even though Gulangong Volcano had been erupting for three months, there were no notams for international carriers. This points out that it is very important to report volcanic activity. Another reason why pilots might inadvertently fly into an ash plume is that the plumes don't always look dangerous. An ash plume can look just like a weather cloud. For example, if we saw a boiling black plume like this, there's no way we would fly into it, right? But what if we saw a cloud like this? Would we fly into it? Well. In fact, this is the plume for Mount Redoubt Volcano in Alaska, and it's full of light gray ash. So, it's important to understand that we can't depend on visual sightings to keep us away from ash plumes. Here's another little surprise. Volcanic ash doesn't show on airborne weather radar. You would think that rocks would reflect a strong pattern, but individual ash particles are just too small to reflect radar. So, if we know a volcano is active, but we can't depend on visual sightings, and we can't depend on radar, how can we avoid the plume? The key to safe operations near an active volcano is flight planning to avoid the plume. For an example of how that can be done, Let's consider the situation at Anchorage, Alaska during the eruptions of Mount Redoubt in December 1989. A Boeing 747 had experienced a four-engine flameout after flying into the ash plume, and the airport had been shut down, but Alaska Airlines was determined to continue operating. I got involved with the Mount uh, Redoubt uh, volcano operation uh, Two days after it, after it occurred, the chief pilot's office uh, asked me to assist them in, in setting up an operation up in Anchorage. We, were, we, we felt we were required to set this operation up because all air traffic had stopped in, in the uh, city of uh, Anchorage. Uh, we realized that there, it was Christmas season, there was a lot of people stranded, and we had some 18 round trips a day that we had a get back into operation. Initially when the mountain went, erupted, the, uh, the NOTAM closed down the airport. Uh, we knew that we had to get in there, one, and that we knew that we could get in there. What happened was, this being the Anchorage airport, Mount Redoubt is in this vicinity. The initial eruption happened uh, in the evening. As this uh, projectile of ash was traveling through the air, there was a jet coming down in this direction and in fact encountered ash on his descent into uh, Anchorage. That, that eruption closed the Anchorage airport. 
it wasn't not so much the eruption as the fact that an aircraft had encountered ash and lost power in all four engines. That was the, uh, the catalyst that alerted the aviation industry to the potential danger up there. From our experience uh, observing the mountain on, on days that we could observe the mountain, we discovered that the plume, or the ash plume, resembled, if not looked exactly like, the clouds, the precipitation clouds, or the, or the moisture clouds in the area. We found it very difficult, if not impossible, to differentiate between clouds, fog, or ash plumes. Ash cloud resembles any other cloud. I happen to have here some Mount uh, Readout ash, and I'll demonstrate exactly what it looks like. It resembles, it resembles fog, it resembles moisture in the clouds. It's very difficult to tell. What we did, we, we didn't avoid the ash, we just flew where there was no ash. We tracked the ash as best we could and just stayed out of that area. We knew the ash didn't cover the whole state of Alaska. It just couldn't do that. Uh, <clears throat> talking to USGS, we got some very good uh, basic information. Not being volcanologists ourselves, uh, one, of the, one of the simplest and most uh, beneficial things we got was that a scenario if a mountain erupted in a still air, the eruption goes straight up and comes straight back down again. Now, as simple as that sounds, what that tells us is the only influence on ash is the wind and uh, velocity and direction. So if we figured we'd track the wind, velocity, and direction, we could determine relatively safely where the ash was and we avoided it. We in fact uh, set up an operations based on the premise that we would brief and debrief every pilot coming in, every one of our pilots coming in. We would use this information that they gathered from observations from the FMS wind readout system and that information was given to us. We would combine that with the information we received from the USGS as far as when the eruptions occurred, the frequency of them, and the contaminant uh, quality of the, uh, of the plume. And then we would take that information and we would formulate a plan or, or a route, if you will, into Anchorage. When there was a report of, of any kind of contaminants in the, uh, in the plume, we, we, we made a special effort to avoid any area where that, would, that plume would be trajected to go. So what we did is we essentially avoided the projected track of any ash by flying over clouds, staying VFR, and when we descended into an area that we considered safe or, or contaminant free, then we would, uh, we would venture into the clouds and descend into the Anchorage area. Considering how hazardous ash plumes are for jet aircraft, it is obvious why it is so important to track where the plume is moving and avoid flying into that area. But, what if you inadvertently fly into a plume that you didn't know was there? Let's review how to recognize an in-flight ash encounter and then go over the recommended procedures for escaping an ash plume. At night, there will be heavy static discharges on the windshields and a bright glow in the engine inlets. This is an actual test of ash being injected into an operating engine. Pilots have reported an acrid odor similar to electrical smoke. The smell of sulfur may also be detected. Multiple engine malfunctions may occur, such as increasing EGT, stall, torching from the tailpipe, and even flameouts. Airspeed may decrease for no apparent reason as the pitot probes become blocked with ash deposits. There have also been reports of electronic equipment overheat and cargo fire warnings. If you recognize any of the indications that you have inadvertently flown into an ash plume, it is essential to take immediate action to save the engines and exit the plume as quickly as possible. The ash plume may extend for hundreds of miles ahead. Attempting to climb above the plume is not recommended because increased thrust will increase engine damage. The best tactic is to make a 180 degree turn and fly back out of the plume. Engine damage can occur very rapidly. It may be necessary for the pilot to use emergency authority to change course and altitude without waiting for ATC approval. The Aerospace Industry Association Volcanic Ash Committee has developed recommended procedures for a volcanic ash encounter. The basic steps in this procedure are similar for any high bypass 
turbine-powered airplane. Let's review a typical volcanic ice procedure. As an example, let's demonstrate the procedure in a 747-400. The first action is to exit the plume as quickly as possible. The steps in the checklist are to reduce engine damage. Disengage the auto throttles to prevent the system from increasing thrust and retard the thrust levers to idle to reduce engine damage. Turn on ignition switches to provide ignition source in the event the engines flame out. For those airplanes with auto ignition or auto start, the system should be on. Turn on all air conditioning packs in high flow and turn on engine and wing any ice to increase engine stall margin. The APU is not available in flight on the 747-400. However, on those airplanes where the APU is available in flight, it should be started to provide backup electrical power in the event engine generators trip off. If engines have flamed out or are in a non-recoverable stall or if EGT is increasing beyond limits, shut down and restart. Activate ignition to prepare for engine restart. To clear the engine from a stall or high EGT, temporarily cut off the fuel. As soon as decreasing EGT indicates the engine has been shut down, a restart should be attempted. Ash damaged engines may not start until clear of ash and airspeed and altitude are within the start envelope. Engines are very slow to accelerate to idle at high altitude. The very slow acceleration may be misinterpreted as an engine malfunction or as a hung start even though the engine is actually starting. As long as the EGT is within limits and the RPM is increasing, try to be patient. It may take two minutes for the engine to come up to speed. Monitor airspeed and pitch attitude. If airspeed is unreliable, establish the appropriate pitch attitude. Most airplane operations manuals have a chart for flight with unreliable airspeed, which provides pitch attitude and power settings to maintain a desired airspeed for different phases of flight. If all engines have flamed out and there is a loss of airspeed indications, one degree nose down will result in a satisfactory airspeed for engine start. Even with engines operating, airspeed may be unreliable. The INS or IRU ground speed indicator will provide satisfactory approach and landing speeds. And ground speed may be available from approach control during landing. There are also a few considerations for ground operations where ash is present. Obviously, a heavy ash falloff from a major eruption will close the airport, but there may be occasions where an airport has just a light dusting of ash, and operations can continue. To reduce blowing ash into the air, use the APU to start engines, and avoid static operation of engines above idle power. Use recirculation fans instead of air conditioning packs on the ground to prevent ingesting any ash into the air conditioning system. And avoid any use of the windshield wipers to prevent scratching the glass. During taxi, use all engines, but limit thrust to the minimum required for slow taxi speed to reduce the amount of ash stirred up. With four engine aircraft on narrow taxiways, avoid increasing thrust on the outboard engines. If any drifting ash is visible over the runway ahead, delay the takeoff roll until the ash has dissipated or at least settled. To prevent ingesting ash into the engines, use a rolling takeoff technique. Remember, it is very important to avoid ingesting ash into the engines at high thrust settings. 
One additional concern is that volcanic ash is very slippery when wet. Volcanologists, pilots, operations planners, and traffic controllers are rapidly learning how to cooperate in reporting ash plumes. The AIA Volcanic Ash Committee is studying ways to provide better information on volcanic activity to assist pilots in avoiding ash encounters. Perhaps in a few years we will have instantaneous tracking and reporting of volcanic explosions. We will eventually have onboard ash detecting systems. But until we have such systems available, it is very important for flight crews, dispatchers, and air traffic controllers to understand the dangers of volcanic ash and take whatever steps are necessary to avoid volcanic ash encounters. I think that pilots still go into these volcanic plumes and, and the ash that, it, uh, that they leave because they're unaware how dangerous they are. They're just not listening, it would seem to me. And uh, the sooner they learn, the, the, uh, the better.